When I was at school and miserably failed my French exam, I told the teacher it didn't matter, I wasn't going to France. What a prat I was. In the last decade, some of my very best angling memories have come from visits to this magnificent country. Every spring, I jump on a train, zip onto the channel, and come to visit waters like this one. This is a Tang Monnier, a six-acre woodland lake set in the heart of the stunning Limousin Valley in southern France. Now, my partner on this carp crew is Brian Scoyles, and we're going to team up and try and catch a 40-pound carp. I think I need to set the scene first of all for this though, because if I'm going to give you some of my trigger memories, it really needs to go back a bit before that so that we can talk about or look at some of the early stuff that, that went before that, where it all went wrong. Bill and I went to um, Holland in 92 and we thought we knew what we were doing we were boldly going to, uh, to, to, to Holland, abroad. We were going to catch all these mega fish. We took a lot of uh, hemp um, and uh, a load of boilies and we were going to slay them. And we caught the odd fish, but basically it was a nightmare. Um, the first thing was we got the baiting wrong. We took a little tiny gas stove, a little pan, and loads and loads of dry hemp and it rained all week so we're huddled in the bivvy and we've got a little pan and we're trying to soak up this hemp and get it to pop and split and everything else and we were ending up with like a pint of hemp every couple of hours and an empty gas canister how much was you baiting with that well we were hoping to hold these masses of dutch commons that were swimming up and down the canal in front of us um, the reality, the reality of it was, uh, we were going round to the far bank, throwing in a, a few of these scoops of hemp that we'd prepared, and then these shills of fish were coming through and wiping us out in about 30 second flat. So we were getting like one take, and then these things were like carrying on. The boilies was just as bad. It was the early days of uh, rolling baits, uh, We've also got a train nearby, which isn't helping. But literally, the boily situation was that sort of like we took some of, um, I think it was probably early big fish mix. And the conditions were really damp. And within a couple of days, these, all these lovely boilies we've taken were getting fur coats. Um, so we had boilies that were going off, hemp that we couldn't prepare in anything like decent quantities. And we had a week. It, on this canal in France, and it was like, didn't really happen. But Bill actually fluked one 30 pound common, although he wouldn't admit it was, he would say it's brilliant angling, but it was actually a bit of a fluke. Um, it just went past, and it's the only, I, I mean, maybe he's not built for speed, Bill, you know, even in those days, and to, to watch him disappearing up the canal, being towed up the bank by this 30 pound common, it was the, it's the first 30 pound common either I think either of us has seen possibly. I mean I can remember on the ferry sat there sort of saying um, sort of like what would we dream would be the perfect session and we both said if we both catch some carp and if one of us has a 30 and that's exactly what happened Bill had the 30. Um, I had lots of little ones about this big um, but we didn't get anywhere near the potential because literally our baiting scheme just wasn't designed for long-range travel and for heavy baiting we didn't know really what we were doing i was used to fishing places like waveney valley and places like this where you could just catty out a few baits from around the tree line and and job was a good one um that was put right the next year because bill really went to town on the baits at that point and so and we went to France and uh, we went with Clive Givens and Ken Townley and um, we'd heard, we'd, we, we had the whisper, we knew the place to go. Uh, Forry de Orient, don't tell anybody it was the place, it was just, just turn up, rock up, Forry de Orient, big piece of water, loads of big carp, just sit there, they'll jump in the net. No. 
We all four of us blanked on that trip and it was, if anything, a bit of a disaster. Um, I think my rods were two and a half pound test curve. My biggest lead, I think, was three ounces. And I had this inland sea in front of us with 18 inch, two foot waves on it. I think the reels at the time were like 3,000 sides. They had about 90, 800 yards of line on at the most. And like, we were rowing these baits out in the karma spells. And like, I could see the back of the spool and it didn't look like anything. It was hardly over the edge of the, the, the sort of bank and whatever. So we had loads of bait that trip, but didn't really have the, have the sir, I certainly didn't have the gear. And so that was basically sort of like, we were sort of going into the unknown and getting it wrong. Um, that applied to the gear, but it particularly applied to the bait. It was all sort of a little bit trial and error. Um, we were rolling baits, roll, uh, rolling quite a lot of our own baits. And, and, and in the UK, I'd got that sorted because, because I'd bought, I think a dozen of these large stainless steel flasks. And I used to roll up all the bait at home, put them in my freezer at home. And then when I was going on those trips, I could just fill these stainless steel flasks up. Essentially uh, like a cool box. Like a, yeah, like a cool box. But I was like taking a dozen. It was like a big investment at the time. I thought I'd crack this for the carrying the bait. I'd actually put it in an ordinary Aladdin flask to start with. And that had been a complete nightmare because with them being glass inside, as soon as you put the cold baits inside, you used to shatter the glass. I, I trashed, I don't know how many flasks at that point. It was ridiculous. Um, and I invested in these, these dozen of these large stainless steel flasks. And then I put those flasks in a cool bag so that I can actually travel and do a weekend in the UK and whatever with frozen bait. And that was okay. But when you were going away for a week or so to somewhere like France or whatever, that wasn't really working too well. Um, so most of the time in France, when we were going there, we, we tended to take ready-mades. And, and I think Nutribates at the time had two that, that were, I, I certainly liked. Um, I think it was pineapple and, pineapple and banana, which was bright yellow. And there was cranberry, which was bright orange. I can remember, <laughs> going off track a bit, I can remember at one of the shows, we, we had a guy come to the stand, the Nutribate stands and says, this is a rip-off, this, this, we know this is a con. He says, because, and I can prove it. So I just said, how do you mean you can prove it? He says, well, you're calling this cranberry nut Nutribates, these ready-mades. And he says, I know for a fact cranberries are red. So this can't be cranberry, a cranberry boil because they're bright orange. You know, it's a con. And, but it was, the, it, was, it was those early days. Um, Everything was bright in them early days. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, most of them had been based originally early on on like sort of semolina type stuff where you just added loads of flavour and let's put a bright colour in them. Yeah, there, there was no um, match the hatch, you know, natural no. colour in. No, none colouring. at all. None at all. And, and you also had this situation as well where, where sort of like, and you still get it. I still do it. I bet you do it. And we all do it at shows. You see people coming up. Oh, that's a good, I like that. And you're like, how do you know what a carp likes? You know, the fact that you might like the smell of a strawberry or a raspberry or a cranberry doesn't mean carp are going to do it. But that's, that was the, where we were at, where, you know, we were still, f the bait, the boily side was still being developed. Then it really started to, t then it started to get a bit more professional, I think. And, and you had the sort of like the, the bait gurus, if you like, people with, that had a lot of respect, that had spent a lot of time um, and a lot of effort in researching what became good ingredients, what should go into a bait. And suddenly these, these home roll stuff with decent ingredients were taking bait to a whole different level. Um, and there were top, top anglers out there that were suddenly putting baits together that were in a different league. Um, I mean, the one that had the biggest impact on me was Dave Moore. We did a, a charity fishing at Cuttle Mill called the Dexter James Appeal. And um, 
it was amazing. I paired up with Dave at one point and we, drew, we were on the pontoon. Now Dave had this trial bait that he'd, he'd put together and he'd talked me through what it was and what he was thinking and it was just amazing. And like, there were like rods, go, we were getting takes after we'd cast out, you know, casting out and sort of putting a rod on the ground and then sort of like just getting to pick up to put some free baits out and the rod was sliding across, was sliding across the pontoon and stuff like that. I, and it was just... You've told me about this multiple times and that was a groundbreaking thing back then, wasn't it? Oh, that, unbelievable. That was yeah. the next stage yeah. of yeah. And that became, in conjunction with nutribates and, and whatever, the big fish mix. And as far as I was concerned, I, I'd just reached the panacea of baits. I had this, this wonderful base mix, which we tweaked a bit. We added a bit of extra green lip muscle and, and sometimes a, a flavour to it. But essentially, this big fish mix just took bait, boily fishing to me, to a whole new level. Um, I mean, my favourite, without doubt, and I used it for several years, was, was big fish mix with a, an elevated level of green lip mussel and, and one that was called Wonder Fruit. And that was just absolutely a fabulous bait. And so that we were starting then to use that bait again with our better tackle and better expertise in France at that point. Um, and, and France was starting to become viable. We, we knew what we were doing. And we actually started helping with some, some advice stuff, some guiding stuff. There was Tim that used to run trips to Fisherbilt. And uh, I went on at least one, possibly two of those, where we sort of had anglers that were fit to been bust out for their first trip in France. And that was all sort of like bait orientated and fishing more at range. I, I felt at that point we were coming to terms with what we were doing. But it was a lot, now, more, a, a lot more scientific in tackle, in bay, everything yeah. was coming together, it wasn't yeah, a bit yeah. of this, a bit, a bit of, of that. that. Yeah, that's right. You know. So that so that that side of things, how to how to get there, how to, to have the right tackle and the right baits, how to use how marker poles, how to use boats to bait up and all this sort of stuff. We were starting to get there. Now, at roughly this same time, Trigger first appeared on the scene. Um, I wasn't directly involved in exactly how it happened, but my understanding was that sort of like in those very early days, you got, you had a, f a, a firm that n had heard of Nutribates and understood that it was a reliable, good company. And they had these, this, these two ingredients, a powder and a liquid, that they were trialing on various animals as, a, I suppose, an incentive to feed as a part of the, the, their diet. And they took this to Nutribates and said, how about this in a, in a fish bait? Um, and they'd left samples and whatever. And I think Bill, Lee Walton and various people had a look at this, whatever, and just weren't too sure, but you know. But eventually they put it into, into I think it was originally into big fish mix and um, gave it to a couple of people one in, the, in my neck of the woods in East Yorkshire, a lad called Les Roberts, and he took it to one of the local waters, and where he was like fishing a tough water where a take a weekend was like average, I think that weekend he had six. And like everyone's going, hang on, this trigger thing, you know, is that what's made the difference? You know, is this possibly as good as the reps said? Um, so I think as far as I'm aware, at that point, then sort of like Lee, Bill and, and people in the factory then start saying, well, let's give this a base mix of its own. Let's tweak the base mix and sort that. Put these in and see what happens, which is what they did. Now, at that point, I was part of the field testing team along with one or two others. And, and the one thing I'll say about Nutribates is they did have a genuine field testing team. We got stuff that we didn't know if it was going to work or not. And I, I can at least think of a couple of things that I was given that I tried that, that didn't work. You know, that was the game. You got the stuff. If it was great, you had an edge. 
if it was rubbish, <laughs> you, you just blanked, you know, and that was, that was how it was. That was what field testing was. But I was due to go for a trip to France. I'd already been fishing a lake um, called the Co well, Commons Lake. It was actually, the proper name was La Mansoire. Now, La Mansoire was paradise. I just, if we're talking about memories, I mean, La Mansoire has a very special place for me. Um, I got a place in a syndicate there, thanks to Ken Townley, um, who I think was the original contact with the French anglers that ran it. And he got us into this commons lake. Bill and I went there and I can remember driving into this campsite where there was a swimming pool and a cafe and everything typical outdoor french area in a bar to back and really nice and people sat around with a, a beer and everything outside and people swimming in the lake and everything and looking out at this lake with a small island in the middle and a and a field with a sea of sunflowers behind it temperature in the 80s and everything and i suddenly thought this is proper French fish in this. This is, this is different stuff altogether. And um, that first trip we caught some decent fish. We caught them actually back on, back on the ready-mades. It was the pineapple and banana and the, uh, the cranberry ones that we were using on that trip because it was a, it was a long drive. It was a long way down and we, we didn't, still didn't have really the facilities to carry the bait and stuff. But it was brilliant and we caught. Um, Bill had one of the big commons, um, I think that was about 38, 39 if I remember rightly. I had, it's called the commons lake because it was mostly commons. My first two fish out of there were zip linears, <laughs> but, but they were fabulous fish. And it was like, I don't know, it was like the, 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 the French scene was totally different down there. It was like... You know, it, it was like people walking past you, sort of like just strolling around the lake and there was people swimming swimming through, through your swim in the middle of the day and you'd have to wind in. We had a young, we had, we had a couple of young lads that used to go out in a pedalo every morning and up, neither Bill or I had brilliant French so we couldn't actually tell this, these young lads not to do it but they thought they were helping us because we had these plumber's poles, these white poles that we were using as the markers which we used to dig into the, into the silt. Um, and we'd go out late afternoon and find the clear spots and put these poles out and, and then next, every first thing next morning out come these lads in the pedalos giving it this bonjour and everything else and they'd go up and lift the poles out put them on the pedalo bring them to the bank and say give us the poles back every morning and we took ages to get this into into the spots and stuff but we caught uh we caught fish we loved it um we went back the following year and we came across one of the first problems we'd ever had that I'd never come across, crayfish. And for whatever reason, we got away with it the first year. But, but this, this, this next year was just amazing. Um, it was just Cray City. You couldn't keep a bait in the water. Now, now that year, um, Bill said to me, he says, I think, I think it was Lee Jackson or someone had said to Bill, you, you can get round the cray problem, he says, if you put bits of mesh, if you tie bits of mesh round and knot them in, so you put the bait inside this mesh. Now we didn't have any mesh. So, so we said, but someone had said you could do it with bits of nylon tights. We didn't have any nylon tights, but that might sound strange. I mean, it was not something we actually took with us very often. Um, so we said, right, uh, come on, supermarché, we've got, we've got to go and find some tight. So we went and got into this large uh, supermarket and there's, this two, there's these two scruffy looking carp anglers that had been living on the bank three or four days and we're walking up down this aisle of all the ladies' lingerie and tights and everything and we're sort of like holding up these samples with these tights like this. I, I, I suppose we shouldn't have been surprised that we had one of the security guards sort of gently following us up and down this aisle of uh, tights. 
But we came back, we were, we were netting uh, these baits and it was better. But after three or four hours, they were coming back with um, like a little blob of super glue and a little bit of tights hanging from the hook, but they'd even got pierced through the bait. Um, and then, then Bill, at one point, uh, Bill said, um, what about wooden balls? Now, at this point, I suppose we could literally have some right comments here, but as it's a family a video and everything else, we'll keep it fairly straight. And I said, well, I might be able to sort that because if I go back to work, uh, I was a teacher and, and sort of like, if I go and see the craft department, I'm sure they'll have catalogues with things like that in. And so we acquired um, hundreds of these different sized wooden balls um, of various shapes and sizes. And just, they were like absolutely perfect, boily size, made of beach, rock hard. And we thought, yeah, they might work. If we, um, if we soak pots of them um, in liquid and we used, I think, a mix of corn steep liquor, uh, neutramino, multimino, sweet cajows and a flavour. If we soak all them, they can look, smell and taste like a boilie. Um, these, by the way, must be 20 years old and I, I should really throw them away but I just don't have the heart because this <laughs> I have real affection for my wooden balls <laughs> am I allowed to say that <laughs> um, but but um, that solved the problem the problem then we had how do you actually fish them do you take a sort of electric a drill with you every time you go, a power drill and sort of drill little holes through to put hair through and everything else? And like, I like to think I invented the D-Rig 20 odd years ago because, and I've still got the bits. I went to um, a picture framer place and I got all these little miniature um, eyed, screwing eye things. Um, we got Loads of, um, I think it was Christen Tunnup, which was their cat stuff. And I whipped them onto the shank with this little eye on so we could screw these wooden balls on. Um, and I look at it now and I think, that's just a D-Rig. I didn't know what I had at the time. We, only, we never used it for anything other than fishing at Lam where we had craze. Uh, as again, that, that's actually one that, that from that period, and I've, I've sort of kept it as a sort of like keepsake, as a memory. It was also the secret time as well. So that literally, there was one or two other people fishing the lake that were also struggling with the craze. And, and they couldn't understand how Bill and I would be sat there, put baits out, boat baits out on a night, and then sit there and then in the morning get a take. Couldn't happen, it's impossible. Because they'd put baits out at roughly the same time and wind them in an hour or so later and there's nothing on the hook, on the hair. It all gone. So how come they were getting takes? So we had this arrangement that if anyone was around when we got a fish in the morning, the other person would immediately run into the margins in the net and unhook it and so, so that we, ne so that if anyone was about, we never brought the bait um, in, into, the, into the bank where the fish was. So, we had this situation now where things were coming together. There was this early trigger and there was the gear to use it. And Martin at this point, my son, was at a stage where we were saying, do you want to, should we go at the Commons Lake together? And at that point, I wanted to take big fish mix. In the factory, uh, the guy said, no, take trigger. So I said, I'm gonna compromise. Big fish mix is my favorite bait. You're saying trigger's better. 
I'll take half and half of each and we'll see what happens. The results were amazing. But I need to top up my tea before I do anything else. So I'm just going to have a fresh brew. I'm going to stop for a minute and make myself a cup of tea. And then when I come back, I'll tell you about what happened. Oh, we're back. Fresh brew. And we can pick up where we left off, which was basically where the trigger memory story now really starts. Perhaps I didn't know it at the time, but this was the point where everything was coming together. Um, Martin and I arrived on the Commons Lake. We knew the lake reasonably well. We wanted to fish the shallows, which had been consistent for me in the past. We had a good quantity of big fish mix. We had a good quantity of trigger. Game on. I still was not convinced about the trigger. It, I, I didn't particularly, if I'm honest, I didn't particularly like the smell. Um, I did, I had total confidence in the big fish mix. And I'm a boring old uh, fellow, fisherman, uh, stick at that. <laughs> and I don't like change. When I know something's working, I want to stick with it. But we'd agreed to trial it and fish it next to each other. So we put out the marker poles in the clear spots. So I went in the boat, put the marker poles out and baited one with trigger, one with big fish mix. Would you say, would you say this is the original testing of trigger? This is the original testing of trigger, yeah. So this As was the first time that, you know, somebody had been sent out with a big batch and this is... I was one of, I, th I think there was a group of us. There was Ken Townley, I think Graham Slater, certainly one or two other people um, were, had part of this, uh, these original batches to, to try in different waters. Um, I think by then people were getting an inkling that this stuff was going to be pretty special. That just the very early results from one or two people, they were all coming back and saying, yeah, I've done well, I've done this and whatever. Um, and so I, I didn't think I was on a loser with it. I just didn't think it could possibly be as good as the, the Wonder Fruit Big Fish Mix that I'd been using already. So we baited the different areas. Now, to cut a long story short on this bit, it was just amazing because Trigger consistently throughout the, the week outfished the Big Fish Mix. Um, and it was like, we started mucking about a bit to, to see if this was fluke. Was this a case of that just happened to be where the fish were? So that where we had these marker pulls out, then we'd switch them around. So one night we'd move the trigger to where the big fish had been and then there. The big fish mix was catching, but the trigger was catching more. And like, if we swap the baits around between the marker pulls, then the, each time that they seem to come to move to the trigger more. Now, bear in mind, big fish mix is a fabulous bait, still is. You know, the number of people swear by it. I would happily use it. But to have a bait that was like matching it even, at the time you're thinking, wow, this could be really, really good. Um, and so there was the merging. The, the sort of like the expertise that the experience then of starting to become quite reasonable at fishing over there and we now had baits that matched that expertise you could bring the two things together and suddenly you're thinking we're getting the hang of this lark um, and like at that point then it started to really really take off and there were several other waters um, it was a water called Le Mans. Actually, that wasn't the name of the lake. It was near Le Mans and the lake didn't have a name. So we just called it Le Mans because it was nearby. Um, and that was um, owned and run by the, the Tony Miller and his family. Well stocked, admittedly, but still at times quite a tricky lake. And there was a, a group of us, uh, myself, Martin, uh, Paul Selman, uh, Derek Stritton, quite a lot of experienced anglers fishing this lake in the early days. Bill, Colin, Colin McNeil, um, whatever. 
And it was Bill that said to me at one point, this, uh, this was sometime afterwards, and, but it, it links back. And he turned around, this is really when things changed. When suddenly you're thinking, if we apply these, that type of quality bait into these lakes, then we can really start dreaming of, of big catches. You know, this, is, this isn't going to be coming across on the ferry and saying, if we get a 30 between us, we've had a good result. This is like talking now, we're going to go there and, and genuinely expect to do well, to catch lots of fish and big fish. Um, and Trigger became a major part of that plan. We would go and bait areas, expecting fish to come to those areas to feed and get better. Again, there was expressions like the three day in approach, which was basically saying, get there and put a lot of quality bait out, in our case, trigger, and then the swim would build over several, several nights and several days. And Le Mans was just amazing. For me, personally, it's one of my all-time memories, again, linked to Trigger. I was a good friend, of, by this time, I was a good friend of a, um, a lad called Kev Green. Now, Kev, unfortunately, is no longer with us. He had he got a brain tumour when he was 39 years old and then lost the fight against it. But in those early years, Kev was, I think, becoming a leading light in the, in the angling world. He was an Angling Times journalist, uh, later become um, an improved, of course, fishing editor. And Kev and I went back a long way from when he was a, a lad. And we used to fish regularly together. And we always used to have an Easter trip. And I took him to Le Mans this one year. And we took a stack of trigger and, with us. And we absolutely took the place apart. And Kev actually, uh, with, his, with his journalist head on, um, said, we, right, we're gonna, we'll make a feature of this. Um, and I caught one of the first 40s out of there. Um, and Kev sort of like did his journalist bit and everything else and was laying on the ground doing all the pitch, getting all the different angle, angles. And it actually produced a, 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 a cover shot for Angling Times, uh, which I, I, I actually, as, as we, we knew we were doing this stuff, um, there. But it's not just me on the cover with this, with this 40, it's the heading that's like mega on there. It's raining 30s. And that was because I think this was Kev's first experience of, of a bait like tri of Trigger actually turning a lake over where it was just ridiculous. We were sometimes getting double takes and we were just catching fish, a lot, a lot of fish, more than we would have dreamt of years before. And that's probably my first true trigger memory where I'm sat there thinking, I mean, it, this, is car, this is Carp Angler's dream world, where you're sat there thinking, I'm getting this right. I've got the gear, I'm fishing the swim, you know, I've got a lake with the fish in, I've got the gear, I know how to use that gear, and I've got food that these fish really want to eat. Um, and it carried on from there. I mean, that was, that was 2001. So the following year, Kevin, at this time, at this point, had been, in, had been put in charge of the carp side of Angling Times. And he was running what, was, what he'd called the carp crew. Um, it featured Julian Cundiff, um, Rob Hughes, Terry Hearn, and myself with Martin. Now, that was quite clever um, in terms of how that came about, because the whole idea of that was he had a range of anglers from 
the, you know, probably the best specimen ang carp angler around in Terry Hearn, um, targeting the types of fish that he was interested in. You had Rob Hughes, who was a, a traveller, if you like, and did some of the match scenes, had competed in the, and, and become world uh, champions at Fisherbill. And you had Julian, who was like the, the, the overnight of the work guy that was um, fitting his fishing in amongst commitments. And you had me, that was like the dad taking his lad fishing at that time. So that you had like something for everybody in the team. Um, and, uh, and like that meant that it opened a few, it, to be honest, it opened a few doors. And one of those doors, after Le Mans, Kev wanted a couple of more foreign ones and he sorted it for Martin and me to go to um, uh, Itang de la Hall. Um, that was originally called Boulancourt and the first time I saw it, I can remember standing on one of the pontoons, Ponton 4 it was. I can remember standing on that and thinking, I must come back and fish this at some point. It's fabulous. It was a great big, um, like nature reserve, but it was stuffed with fish. And like Martin and I sort of like went there to do an Angling Times, uh, an Angling Times feature. And like, I think we went possibly two, three years, twice, possibly. But certainly one of the trips is like another uh, trigger memory. Because you had access to a bow and we went out and baited up the swims. And then I think it was about third night in, third or fourth night in, we had one of those nights that you just dream about. Um, and during the course of that night, Martin had a PB common, 46, which was a, just a magical night anyhow. And then I think about an hour later, I had a PB mirror, uh, just scraped just, uh, just over 50. So in that one night, the two of us on that Ponton 4, both of us had a, a PB. Um, and I mean, this is a dad's moment, this. I can remember um, sitting on the edge of that ponton about four, half past four in the morning with the sun just coming up. Um, we're mozzied, because the mozzies there were a nightmare. We were mozzied, hot, sweaty, and I'm sat there with one of these little stubby French beers and everything else, just thinking, fishing don't get any better than this. And, and it just, that, that week was just like that every night. We'd go out in the boat and just pile a load of trigger and, and, and particle out. And like the fish, you'd, you'd watch the fish come from the far side, from the nature reserve part. They'd just be topping across and then during the night you'd get the takes. We went back the next year and I can't remember ever fishing in temperatures like it. Um, but it was like spectacular again. And we both had PB grass carp. Now, some people like them, some people hate them, but when they get to the size that we were catching, these things were just magnificent. So that was just two memories um, from Le Mans and Lahore, where, where Trigger just made the fishing almost easy. I keep saying Trigger, by the way, and we actually weren't using Trigger. Because um, it's worth mentioning at this point that there are two variants and I'm actually a fan of um, Trigger Ice, which is the, 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 if you like, the slightly spiced up version. It's got additional emulsifiers and, and, and mixed spices in it. That to me makes it just that little bit better in the colder water. I've always been a fan of spices, right back to the early Waveney days. And and so that, although I, the, the baits are essentially the same, with the ice, you've just, to me, I think you have a little bit of an edge in colder water, which actually might be quite useful today if, that, if, if, if we are to get anything today. Um, at that point, Kev had diversified, not only as an Angling Times reporter, he'd also become um, good in front of the cameras. You might be thinking he could have given you a few tricks, but that's, 
<laughs> I, I used to watch Go as a kid. Did, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did the first of all. He did a Predator series, um, and then he went on to do. He took over um, the second series of Carp Crew from Jan Porter, and I think as a as a friend and everything else. When they put the programme together, they wanted a, a Canadian carping, a canal carping, a river carping, a surface carping, and a, a French carping. So that he rang me right at the blue one day and said, do you want to go and film for Discovery as part of the Carp Crew series? I said, yes, like you would. It sounded like good fun. And he said, I'll leave the... I'll leave the fishing side, I'll sort the, the travel side of the, and all this, if you can sort out venues and all the rest. And I knew just the place. Again, coming back to the, 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 the Miller family, they had a, a, a group of waters, and one of them was their jewel in the crown, which was a, a Tang Monier. Now, that was a beautiful, fairly small lake with a little jeep directly on the bank with some lovely fish in it and I'd fished it a couple of times before and it just struck me as absolutely perfect because we had a we had a jeep where the the camera crews and whatever could could have their base uh, the the actual swims were nearby um, and it was just a beautiful place to film so the arrangements were made and I think in terms of this triggering memories that the week that followed was probably the best week's filming, fishing, in my lifetime. Got him! <laughs> what a start! That's a kipper! Come on! Well done, sir. That'll do it. Yeah, Excellent. that'll go. We'll go for that. <laughs> that needs a saddle across it. I don't believe this. <laughs> well, you're just plain greedy. <laughs> Look at this. Fish sitting in net, nice and quiet. Brian, another fish on, greedy. <laughs> we arrived at Monnier, and just to set the scene, it's a fairly small lake with the deep water down the middle, which is caused by a stream coming one end, at one end, which runs that, which creates a bit of a current down the middle and then over the overflow at the far end on the dam wall. The far bank is total no fishing with trees all the way along. So the obvious thing to do is to, sort, is to, to put baits tight to the trees on the far margin and, and hit and hold and hope the fish take them there but we had we had the edge we had a stack of trigger and some backup pellet house pellets and things and I'd said to Kevin these fish will come to the bait so that what we're going to do is we're going to get there on the Saturday afternoon set everything up we're going to go out in the boat and put a stack of bait out in that middle area and then we're just not, we're not going to fish it. We're just going to do that. I sound as if I'm back on the program here a little bit, because I can remember doing this little bit for the cameras. And like, we sort of said, and then we'll give them 24 hours just to get on that bait. So we had this situation then where, where we, we went, I went out in the boat and baited up this middle area and we didn't fish it. We just waited. Now the following day, we got up first thing in the morning, looked out from the balcony of the sheep, which looked over the lake, and there is nothing there but fizzing and bubbling over this bait. There's obviously fish on this bait big time. So we put the baits out on this baited area, and I thought one's got, one of these is going to go within five, ten minutes, and it didn't. So I'm literally sat under this balcony near this sheet with the rods there and everything else and there's fish fizzing all over this bay and gradually as the morning progressed 
seven, eight, nine and whatever. These large patches of fizzing gradually got less and less and less and it just stopped. So that I'm looking at this area and I'm thinking, what's going on here? This can't happen here. This is, this is, you're on the trigger. I'm on, the, I'm on the trigger here, right? And it, it's, it, it's, it's got a stack of bait and there was fish there. And then I just got this absolutely perfect drop back. Picked the rod up, wham back, tight, boom. And I knew instantly I was into a good fish. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Kev's da Kev winds in and dashes in for the next swim. Cameras are rolling, everything's good. Beautiful sunlit morning. We plays this fish out in, t in, in there. And it's like the carp angler's prayer, isn't it? Please don't come off, please don't come off and all that. And eventually, after a while, comes up, it's obviously a big fish, and we nets this fish. Within that first morning, we've got the, fi the fish we'd come to France for. It, because the whole program relied on having a big fish, because you'd gone to catch a fish of your dreams, sort of thing. And we'd got it in the net. So, at which point, the... The cameraman switches off, sound engineer relaxes, we all stop for a minute. The director comes down and says, right, let's just have a think about how we're going to do this. We'll just reposition round and, and, and sort of like, if, if, you put, if, if we bring it to bank there and you, you do the filming there and we'll move that camera to there and the sound, if you stand there and all this. And we just stood there while this fish is ca nicely resting in the net. And at that point, all of us, including me and Kev, we'd totally forgotten about the other two rods that were on the pod just behind us. At which point, I get an absolute one toner on one of these. It was total mayhem. It was chaos. Because suddenly, I want to grab this rod I'm falling over a cameraman who's got one of the, this, remember this is years ago, so it's one of the great big bulky jobs. So I've got a cameraman that's trying to get back to let me get to the rod. I've got a sound engineer that's tripping over the cameraman. Kevin's sort of like trying to get out a shot and everything else so that I can, for, for 30 seconds or so, while this one tone is going on, it's like chaos. And eventually everyone scatters, camera's back, the camera's back on, everyone's out of shot except for me. And, 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 I grabs the rod, I plays this, and I'm thinking, I'm into another big fish here. This, this, is, this, is, this is another lump. Plays that one out. Kev's there again, still in the swim, because he was there with the net. He's put the first one slightly to one side. It's resting, it's fine. I'm playing this second one. We get that in the net, and I'm thinking, I've got a brace of 40s here on the first morning. I mean, this is like filming dream it's absolute magic um, and like so we go through the process we get the first one out and we take the pictures of that and whatever we then put slide that one back we then go and take the pictures of the sec do the second one and all this um, there's a lovely little bit of a shot in this film that just you, you, you actually, by the way, if, you, if you're ever bored, you can actually still find this film on YouTube under Carp Crew 2. Um, there's this lovely little bit. Kevin and I used to take the mickey out of each other. He was always going on about the fact that I need to lose a bit of weight, um, which is fairly true. And I was always taking the mickey because he was always conscious of the fact that he was, he was losing his hair at quite a young age. So there's this lovely little bit of banter, which... Um, the director told us off a little bit for where I think Kev, uh, Kev says something like, uh, oh, that's a typical French fish, short, pot-bellied, uh, a bit like the guy that caught it, or something like that. Um, and I turned around and said, well, perhaps the next one won't have any air or something. <laughs> it, it was something like this. And there's, a, there's the, the director behind the camera's going, you know, like, don't, <laughs> you know, no, keep, keep to the script, guys, and this sort of business. But, but to be honest, we had a brace of 40s and we didn't really care. So we, we filmed this, this little bit. Um, 
And at that bit, Andy, uh, the, the director, then says, Brian, you're a prat, or something along those lines. He says, you should know better. What about filming continuity? We can it doesn't work. We can't use the two fish. We can't do the brace. So it says, um, I says, why not? I mean, we, we just, it genuinely, we've just caught them and the second one, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, 10 minutes of each other. He said, we can't use it. He says, because you took your hat off. Now, at which point, I, I used to have this, I thought I looked really trendy. I had this, this trendy cowboy hat type thing. I thought it made me look... I've, I've seen it on the clip. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It made, it made me, I thought it made me really look the part, you know, sort of thing. Um, and, and with it being hot and whatever, once we'd had that first fish and getting ready for the weighing of the first fish, I thought, I'd, so I'd put my hat off, took my hat off. So the second fish, I didn't have my hat on. So he said, we can't use it. We've not got the continuity. It, people won't believe it's a brace. So literally, after we'd weighed them and put them back, everyone's chuntering about, oh, we can't. And one of the cameraman says, I've got an idea. I said, he says, yes, we can. He says, if we refilmed a little bit where your hat fell off, we could put that in the middle. So literally, <laughs> and this is the only bit of that bit that's fake, Got him! <laughs> what a start! That's a keeper! Come on! Well done, sir. That'll do it. Yeah, Excellent. that'll go. We'll go for that. <laughs> that needs a saddle across it. I don't believe this. <laughs> well, you're just plain greedy. <laughs> Look at this. Literally, at that point, after we'd wound the rods in and everything else, in the middle of the afternoon, reasonably similar light, well, it was good light conditions, just the same. I then cast one of the, rod, the rods back out, no baits, just cast them out into open water. One of the guys went out in the boat and I took my, the line from my left hand rod, the, the, the rod that had got the run. I then put my hat on he rolled like mad so that I got the run. I then bent down to the rods and my hat fell off. And then I stood up and picked the rod up and that little bit was put in the middle so that you link the two films together. We must have filmed that about eight times because that hat wouldn't fall off. And even the one they used, if you watch it closely, you'll actually see where I go down to the rod like this, and I tilt my head for the hat to fall off, and it wouldn't come off. So I'm actually leaning it forward, and I'm picking the rod up, and I'm going <laughs> to get the hat to come off. And it was like not only catching the brace, but also the funny bits like that, and the banter made that a very, very special week. And we had an absolute stack of fish with, again, that large bed of trigger ice in that middle area with those fish just coming out and just feeding in that open water. It was just magic, absolute magic. If you're talking trigger memories, don't get any better than that for me. It was just a, a magical moment. But it did. Because the following year, or better still, at the, at the end of that carp crew week, we went, as we drove out, Kev said, we're coming back here. I mean, we're gonna come back here and just have a, a week's fishing. So as soon as we got back, I booked a week the following year, just for Kev and I, no cameras, no nothing, just a holiday week. And, we got there and again, we did exactly the same. We, because we had the lake to ourselves and there was no pressure with the filming, we, we worked on the system where we just fished the house swim and the open water during the days, during the night, sorry, 
and then during the days we'd go wandering about with a couple of rods and just do a bit of stalking and we'd take it in turns to either stay in the house swim or do the stalking. One day one of, one of us would go, one would be the other. And when Kevin died, several years later, I helped sort out some of his fishing gear for Joe, his wife. And uh, Joe said to me, you must have something of Kevin's as a keepsake, as, as, as a memory. Now, I'm not short of fishing gear um, or whatever. I've been very lucky in that way. Um, and I couldn't think of what to, t what to have. So in the end, I said, Joe, um, I'll have this uh, spool because it is, a, for me, a very, very magical memory of my time with Kevin. And it's broken. It'll never be used. I will never use it. I haven't even these days got a real little fit on. But it's, it's a very, very special memory. If you look at it closely, it's not got a line clip. There's just a hole. And that's the memory. Because basically that afternoon, I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday afternoon of the week, it was my turn to go stalking down the, down the shallow end. So I wound my main rods in and disappeared off down the other end. A small bed of trigger, trigger ice spread out. Bait just gently underhand swung under, over it. And I'm just sat there enjoying the, the lake, the weather, everything and I get a take and I plays this fish out which is obviously one of the better ones and it turns out to be my biggest fish from the lake which was 58 pound I was over the moon so plays out this fish lands it stakes the net out let it rest for a minute and call for Kevin who wound in and came down did all the photographs and everything else and then he went back to the main swim got cussed out again I just sat for another half an hour or so and then decided no I'll, uh, that'll do me I'll just go and sit and have a beer with Kev so I goes back up to the main swim and while I'm sat there Kev gets a one toner and he plays out this fish and it was his biggest fish from the lake it was a different big fish and it was another 58 pounder. So within an hour of each other, we'd both had 58s. Don't get any better than this. At which point Kev said, um, let's just wind in, shall we? Let's walk into the village, go in the bar to back, have two of the largest steaks, double fries and several beers. You know, just to celebrate. So I said, I'm not going to argue with that. That sounds like a plan. So at which point, Kev winds in, but Kev's still a bit of a keeny, always was. So he says, um, I'm just going to get mine ready for pub chucks when we get back, just in case I'm in a fit state to cast out. So he winds in, winds in two of the rods gets the third, casts it out, clips it up, starts winding it back. He's about halfway back when it goes solid. Suddenly the rod bucks over and the line just absolutely melts off this spool. It gets to the point where it's on the clip, which he'd clipped up. It's going so fast it literally just shattered off the line clip, which just went ping and disappeared, leaving the hole in this spool. And just disappeared, the line just melted off down the lake. The fight just went on and on. It was amazing. Uh, poured line off, gained a bit back, 
poured lined off, gain a bit back. It was just unbelievable. We hadn't a clue what was going on. And then eventually Kev gets his fish close in. I reached down and could net it, could net it. And he'd foul hooked a big head. Not me. <laughs> Genuinely, this name of this, this car was a big head. And there was like apparently only four or five in there. And they don't eat boilies or anything else. But he just foul hooked it as he was winding back to, for us to go at the pub. Um, and he'd foul up this thing, which just absolutely had just mullered the fight and everything else. We just looked at it and just went, well, what on earth is that? But apparently there was only about three or four of these things in there. It shouldn't have actually been in there, I don't think, they should, but they'd, they were in and they'd grown enormous. So out of curiosity, we weighed it. That was another 58. What is the chance of three fish being 58 pounds within an hour and a half? But this big head's amazing. The pi I, keep, I still look at the picture and laugh because it is just an amazing fish. And it's just another fabulous memory. I think you get the idea. I mean, being involved with Nutribates from day one has been very special for me. Having been involved in some fabulous bait developments with originally the big fish mix, Heineval big fish mix, and especially with Trigger and Trigger Ice, has been very special to me. It's helped me make some very special friends. Um, I've treasured working with Bill Cottam, Rich Skidmore, Lee Walton, Chuck Backhouse, all those people over the years. In more recent times, I just think what's happening with Nutribates now is very special with Jason and Richard and the, and the modern crew is brilliant and I'm just delighted to be part of that. So yeah, Triggering Memories, I think it's a great name for what we're, what we're talking about here because Trigger and Nutribates have provided lots of special memories. I still get asked what bait I'll be using next year. I've used Trigger and Trigger Ice for 23 years now. I'll leave it to you to guess what I might be using next year. Thanks for watching.